So, Susan hopefully is able to hear us now. Our other panelists are being connected in. Thank you, Susan, for this very quick <laughs> and short overview. I look at the last few decades of our history of revolutions, and that, in fact, um, means that I have a lot less to say, what I meant to say as by way of an introduction. It also shows, however, what the situation that we are in is like when we're talking about something like global revolution, which is the aim for today. With everything that you've just said, we have realized, I believe, that it's incredibly complex. We could take each and every one of these events and talk about it for an entire weekend. And yet, there is something in all of this that is simple and that it's worthwhile to look at this simplicity and what can be shared thanks to that, despite the thousands of kilometers uh, of distance, different cultures of protests, uh, different situations that people are uh, struggling in, that there seems to be something in all of this that at least potentially belongs together in its heterogeneity. So revolutions today, Today, and that goes back to not only what Susan said, but also to the pictures that she showed us. Today, again, we're talking about the revolution, not only because the situation of the world is disastrous and miserable, as we've heard throughout the last few days. This world is not only a world characterized by borders, by patriarchy, racism, and violence. Uh, we live in a world of unrest, of uprisings, of social movements, of counter power, a world in which a despair is exploding, but it is also a world of uh, social imagination, a, a world where other relationships, other subjectivities, uh, another common and a planetary conscious is not only thinkable, but it, there are attempts of breathing life into it. Uh, including on the streets. And in all of this, um, we see ourselves reflected. We, from this, we draw inspiration. We are driven by it. We are encouraging each other. And I think it is fair to say that without uh, being too much of an optimist, uh, considering the history of the world. Now, to put it in very specific terms, and this uh, takes me to our forum and what we want to talk about specifically now, the need for or the wish for a political and social revolution in uh, the world is part of the history and it's specifically part of the history of the last few days. That is what we want to recapitulate, to talk about also by uh, looking at examples uh, looking to Syria, amongst other things. And Susan also touched on some examples. The people want to bring down the regime. This is what, for 10 years now, has been echoing all over the world, this cry. And it's not being silenced. It's very simple, but it's um, something that people worldwide find themselves reflected in, in their needs. And uh, they are taking to the streets in their very own ways. And the same happened in Syria 10 years after the civil war, which uh, started in 2011, had its beginnings in 2011. Now there are 500,000 people who died, uh, millions of people who have dis been displaced, a proxy war, and the inability of the international community to respond. The Syrian question about uh, democracy and emancipation um, has also become globalized. That, too, is part of this sad story, literally not only in 2015 and in uh, the European summer of migration, as it was called, have there been calls for democracy and emancipation that uh, also were heard in Europe and that also changed this continent and have less left their traces. This is what we'll talk about with Said Al-Batal. Hello, welcome. 
Said is a filmmaker now based in Leipzig and in Berlin. However, when he was 20 years old, he came from Damascus and went to Duma, a city freed by the rebels. And along with a friend, he documented uh, with a camera what the rebels were doing. And as a result of that, this film still recording came about. Uh, 500 hours of camera footage were used to create it. From that, footage was selected. It's been awarded numerous prizes and, in fact, can also be watched as part of our event here. So welcome once again, Said. We're happy to have you here. So that was 2011, but 2019 also. And in the months prior to the pandemic, we have seen that uh, world history is characterized by strife and struggle, maybe even more so than it's ever been the case. Uh, uprisings in Ecuador, in uh, Algeria, in Hong Kong, in Iraq, in Iran, in France, in Haiti are just some examples. They are and were uh, supported by new civil societies and radical social movements such as Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future and the Global Feminist Revolt. In Chile, the place of birth of neoliberalism, during the revolt at the end of 2019, at a bank where normally those would sit who collect, collect debts and who uh, it was written, you owe us a life. That may be a good slogan for uh, the planetary revolution, something we can talk about. So on the basis of an uprising starting by students who protested against an increase in fares by three cents, um, a criticism of neoliberalism arose that uh, continues until today. And it has seen global feedback and the feminist uh, collective also performed and also symbolized the spirit of the Chilean uprising, same as the flag of Mapuche did that was flying everywhere over the squares. So this was an uprising that went beyond borders, not only the outer borders of the country, but also inner borders and barriers. And whether it will stay like that and what will happen as regards a new constitution, this is what we want to discuss with Pirina Ferretti. Welcome. We're glad to have you. She is a Chilean sociologist and she focuses mainly on the production of subjectivity under neoliberalism. She is a member of the Nodo Ventiuno Foundation, which is a forum for anti-neoliberal feminist and the democratic left. Welcome. Now, it's impossible to take everything that plays into this, as we saw during Susan's presentation, and put it all into one hour. But we have agreed that we want to look at two questions specifically. The first part is that we want to discuss the question of how these new movements, new struggles, new uprisings are composed, and how they challenge traditional um, perceptions of the world. And the second question that we want to discuss and that we have to discuss, of course, also because we have Said here, is the question of the response to uprisings and revolts, to massive political violence uh, that uprisings are confronted with, which also characterized the last 10 years and um, in Chile, too. Perina is speaking of state terrorism against the people. Said and uh, Perina, the stage is yours. Said will start and then he'll be followed by Perina. And then Susan has the floor uh, for a short response. And then we'll start uh, involving the audience. We also have Julian Turve here who has some comments regarding uh, the technical issues, some housekeeping. Welcome. Julian, go ahead. Yes, welcome. Welcome to Backstage. Uh, on behalf of Chrissy and myself, my name is Julian Tuve. I'm co-moderating the forum. And time and again, people have questions about uh, the interpreting feature. 
if you look at a zoom at the bottom, there's a row and there is an interpreting feature where you can select the language. If you do not see the, the button, it's, if it's not being shown to you, you'll have to download and install the zoom app. Alternatively, you can watch the YouTube streams that are in either German and English. And we have an active audience who's also participating. And we'd like to encourage the audience to ask questions in the Q&A section only. And please, when you post a question, also write down at whom you are directing your question. And um, I will select some of your questions and direct them at our participants here. So thank you to the audience for uh, getting active and being part of this. I look forward to an exciting discussion. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, Thomas and his team for the great job and uh, standing up for the difficulties of um, the internet and the connection online and how to we can uh, make all of this happen in the new age of the internet. And uh, I would also write, would like to start by, uh, by by saying that it is true that I come here as a director and I am uh, here also uh, as a participant of the Syrian revolution since 2011, since the moment uh, that the revolution really started and uh, also as an eyewitness for all of this. And for that, I would like also to bring to the table some ideas. One of the first idea I want to say is that revolution is a process open to everybody and therefore everybody can join. That's why a simple uh, uh, working uh, guy in uh, Syria could uh, join revolution in 2011 and end up as one of the main military leader of the armed revolution after 10 years. And this is also open the door to um, a question, a big question of how the world see the revolution and how the revolution see itself. Because um, I think from the outside, there's a lot of heroism seen in the revolution came from the inability for uh, others. And by others, I mean everyone who's not affected directly by what's happening on the ground uh, in Syria or any other in any of any other place where the revolution start about uh, why people will uh, face uh, difficulties and why people will stand up to death in in, in sake of uh, freedom and in sake of uh, um, change, radical change of what's happening in their life. And I think one of the main answers for this is the understanding of the people that not all life is life and some uh, life is worse than death and merely life is not accepted anymore. That's why people would stand in front of death because they are seeking for a better, uh, better future for this. So that's why standing up to death is so much coming from seeking for a new life and putting on the table uh, a red line of blood that would not accept the new uh, uh, wave of or the new generation or the new coming future to be exactly the copy of the past and this is also um this is also well free take us immediately to the question that everyone is always asking what or who uh, uh what can we do to, when fighting after the revolution is defeated but i here have to ask who's speaking of what and after 10 years in syria it's very common to say that the revolution had defeated but then Who's, who's saying this and who's raising this question is a very important key, key role to understand all of this. And to understand this, I want to go back to 2011 when the term Arabic Spring came to the table. And I, I want to remind everyone that Arabic Spring was not how the revolution in Egypt nor the revolution in Tunis back then was defining itself. It was a term coming out directly from Europe and I don't think this was so um, innocent. I, w I think this was met, meant to be to cut first, to cut the relationship between the Arabic Spring again and, and from the movement that was happening also all around the world in 2011. I want to remind you there was Occupy Wall Street in America, there was a huge demonstrations in Greek, there was a huge demonstration in Spain, and there, there was a 
uh, a few attempts for also demonstrations and movement in Iran and all of this uh, Arabic Spring has tried to cut the relationship from the rest of the world and maintain all the movement inside the Arabic dialogue, which I don't un understand exactly why and for the benefit of whom. And if we look, zoom in onto the, what's happening, for example, in Iraq, why Iraq is super uh, related to Arabic Spring and not, have nothing to do with the Iranian movement and the Green Revolution, and why the movement in Syria and Lebanon uh, is not related to the movement on Ukraine back since the Orange Revolution until today. And um, I want to also uh, put an um, very, in Arabic, it's very, very different and it's very clear in Arabic, um, the opposite of defeat. The opposite uh, of defeat in Arabic exactly means resilience. It doesn't mean victory. So as long as the resilience continue, there is no defeat. And it's up to the people on the street in the end to decide if it is really, uh, they cannot stop, uh, they cannot continue this resilient or it's still going. And, up, and it's not a question of others if the revolution still continue or not. And I also think that if you, what really scare the world system in general, that if you zoom out from any de demonstration, all demonstration look the same. If you look at Tahrir Square, if you look at Hama, because it was the only place in Syria that man people managed to gather in a huge number without the regime killing them, or attack them, if you zoom out of Tunis, if you zoom out from Chile, if you zoom out from any big demonstration in Hong Kong, they all look the same. And this is somehow scare the current regime worldwide in the world. And I think also that the world, the world have forgot that justice in the, in the end is not a process. Justice in the end is a feeling before it become a process. And to achieve this feeling of justice is uh, the, a, key, a key role on asking for revolution and justice uh, in the term of process or, or in the term of studies or in the term seem to neglect that this feeling, if it's not satisfied, we cannot really move forward. And that's why uh, a revolution is only defeated when the revolutionary forget this. The difference between abandoned between uh, true life and uh, the sake of merely survival. And we can take, for example, a reference from another great Syrian uh, film, which is like, for example, for Sama, when uh, the mother and the father decide to go back to Syria, taking back uh, to Aleppo, to the most dangerous place back then in Syria, taking back their own, the newborn child um, as a significant act from them to say that it's either a true life or no life. Survival alone is not enough. And I also say that from um, that, that, that there's a huge um, difficulties to for Europe in general to accept the reality what, of what's happening on the world because somehow um, the leadership of the movement of what we can call global revolution is not centralized in Europe anymore. And it's not centralized in theory anymore. And this, it's not centralized around theory. I think this is one of the major difference between the revolutionary of the workers back 100 years ago and the revolutionary of today is because the revolutionary of today is the revolution of customers and revolutionary of products where a human becomes some kind, somehow a product. And I also, I uh, would say that the new pandemic have showed us, I don't know, um, is, can you hear me clearly or is there some connection problem? Okay. Um, uh, I think also that this uh, new uh, upcoming uh, movement all around the world, on the ground, people know how, they, how much they are con connected. I remember in Syria, when, in every demonstration we went, there was always a reference to other people of demonstration everywhere, wherever it's happened. We raised, uh, we raised flags for uh, back then to Wall Street in 2011. We raised flags back then for uh, the movement in Sudan, 2013. We, moved, we, we were always so much caring about this zoom out picture that always seemed familiar for us when you look back from, from it. And I think that Europe is so much struggling to deal with the fact 
that it is not in the center of all of this. And that's why it's running to theory. And theory have not been important for this generation for one key, one key element. This key element is that back then in the 70s and the 60s, especially in the mid, uh, middle, uh, the, um, on those movement that was growing in Germany or, or any, any other place in, Ger in Europe, theory was so important because once you are with theory, you get significant support. But in this new age, there is no significant support if you, if you, if you apply theory. The radical left have disappeared and the left the new left is not uh, dedicated to the case, and they are not really, they are not really supporting. I mean, if you want to look on the uh, ray, rising of the radical Islamic movement as the name of ISIS, it really re was a significant turning point in Syria. Was the chemical attack, which is I witnessed personally in Eastern Ghouta in, 2000, in August 2013, and I remember exactly that day when when the American army turned back on Syria, when they had the deal with the regime on taking all the chemical weapon, and then it's okay to kill us with other weapons. It, the, only, the only people on the ground that was saying all along from the beginning that we are alone and no one is standing with us and we have to take this fight on our own and don't depend on no one around the world was ISIS. That's why ISIS have stolen somehow a lot of voices in the, on the the ground because somehow the world have failed Syria and it didn't fail Syria and the past is still failing Syria till today. I think the radical left is running away from the significant fact that today and now it's happening. It's not in the past. It's not 10 years ago. Today, if the radical left now wake up and say, OK, where is those uh, leftists in Syria that still exist? Let's support them with, by what they need, not by what we think they need. And we don't need so much conferences. We don't need so much food. Actually, people in the Syria, we need, they need support on uh, military level, for example. They need support on medical level, for example. And through all of this, I want to say that theory become important again when believing in this theory uh, offer you some kind of an umbrella. And this umbrella provide you with a material thing. Eventually, the revolution is not is not just thoughts; it's action on the ground. And when the abs with the absence of the left, the dedicated uh, solidarity that stand with the fact that what the people need and provided with them, with the absence of that, there's a gap always filled. This gap is always filled with what I would say polluted money. That's why Syria become a proxy war. Syria become a proxy war because. Any other because people on the ground in the last moment when you want to def uh, when you want to uh, defend your family and your house from direct killing in a brutal way, you don't really ask the question who's giving me the gun to defend myself. So that's why people, when they found no one but radical Islamists providing this weapon, they took it. And this is so much on the shoulder of the world that have. Put, uh, put back all the uh, big talk about human rights and all the big talk about uh, freedom and how much eventually what the Syrian revolution have showed me personally, and I think to a certain level, Arabic uh, discord also all around the world have seen this personally, that eventually Europe was talking only about itself. It's talking about the freedom of the European citizen, it's talking about the, the human rights of the European citizen, and they don't really care about what's happening around the world when it's come to the fact. Then again, the pandemic have showed us that there is no border. The pandemic have showed us how much corrupted is the medical system, for example. And now there is companies uh, competing between each other to find the medicine rather than working together because they want to profit. They don't want really to have a cure. And this is also super essential to, to either, either we stand up to those and we fight for a better health system all around the world, because if you can, if you want to focus on the health system only in your country, this will not solve the problem. Eventually, if a virus wake up in in uh, the far away world, it will come to you. So we need to solve it worldwide, a health system that work. And a health system, this is just a key stone on, in the big movement around the world. And I don't want to uh, extend more because I know that this uh, it's a short time, but I want to reference that colonialism in Arabic doesn't mean colonialism. Colonialism in Arabic means reconstruction, like literally reconstruction is the word that how 
since 100 years ago was translated. Because uh, under the umbrella of France, they come to us and say, we are here just to build for stuff for you and to lift you up to where we are now in, in, in uh, uh, evolution, and then we're going to leave. That's why they use the word reconstruction. That's why also uh, th under this umbrella, it was a colonism in disguise. And I, I also would wonder how much all of this is happening. And if it continues to happen, more and more people around the world will turn their back to Europe. More and more, we will, we will give up even on the discord in English. We, will, we are back so much into discord in Arabic and in China, Chinese or in Spanish, because we don't believe anymore that we have, we are, the words are received in this rich world that's, that's leading everything. And that's and the more that some humble action from Europe to say, okay, we are not leading this, we are supporting this, and we're standing by you. If you don't, if they don't do that, the gap will continue to go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, to the point that Europe will be really left behind. And I mean it in a very general way. And I want to also to go back to the resilience. As long as resilience continue, there is no defeat. And it's not up to the studies or the others to decide when I cannot resilient anymore. I think even exile is a kind of resilient because we chose exile. The, the, uh, Bashar al-Assad always opened the door for people to come back. If they accept him and sign on paper that they accept him and no one, no one is taking this chance because there is a act of resilience that's still in the core of the movement. Victory might come in the future against Bashar al-Assad, but this is nothing. This is just a step in the, to build this reconstruction of the new world. I think I have taken my 15 minutes, even though I can talk a lot more, but let's leave it also to the discussion later. <laughs> Thank you all. Yes, I, and uh, I would directly go to Pirina. Can everyone hear me? Very good. So thank you. I've just had an echo here, but I'll go on. First of all, I'd like to thank Medico International for inviting me. And also, I'd like to thank Susan and Said and Mario, my co-panelists and the moderator. I would like to talk about uprisings and revolt and revolution in Chile. There's quite a bit that coincides with what Susan said and also quite a bit that matches what Said just said. And on that basis, we can then enter into a discussion about these kinds of uprisings and revolts that emerge and emerged at different corners of the world, and which are still, which are still unresolved. We don't know yet what the process is going to end like, because we're still right in the midst of it. In October 2019, there was a very strong social movement, to put it like that, in Chile, as you all know. And that continues to exist. And we're currently going through a process of constitutional change. So that is where we need to redetermine and shape the future of our country in the medium and long term. So this uprising started in Chile Although we are actually a neoliberalist country, which has been going that way ever since the 1970s, so since the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. So the modern history of Chile has been going on or lasting the last 50 years. Our society, our culture, and also politics in our country have undergone tremendous changes over that period. If you look at photos or documentary films from the reign of Salvador Allende, for example, 
you will see that back then there were workers and organizations that were entirely different from the people who took to the streets in October 2019. So this neoliberal process of change was really a, an in-depth one. It's had been going on for 15 years, after all, and it's a very pronounced type of neoliberalism. In our society, it's only about goods and commodities. Everything has been commodified, water, health, pensions, and that's been the case for 50 years. And we're now seeing the consequences of that. And those are terrible consequences for a very large part of the population. There's more and more elderly people who simply do not get paid enough pension, who can't live off their pensions. Our companies and enterprises, in the meantime, are writing record profits. That's also true, for the, by the way, for the health system. We're quite similar in that respect to the US. For instance, if somebody falls severely ill, then often their family cannot even afford to have their family member taken care of in hospital. And the same is true for students. Often they have to take on a debt which they have to repay over 30 to 40 years in order to go to university. And there are many young professionals who hold two or three jobs at the same time, a day job as a teacher, for example, and an evening or night job as uh, subway conductors. And that has led to a high level of uncertainty, a constant uncertainty. And that in turn culminated in the October 2019 movement, because the conditions of living that neoliberalism is uh, pushing on us are simply no longer tolerable. Only 20% of the workers in Chile are unionized, so 80% of all workers in Chile are not represented by any traditional trade union. But still, this movement was not triggered by the government or by the left or any political party, but it was a spontaneously emerging popular movement. Over the first few days, um, everybody was really shocked, especially the institutions at the level of spontaneity, but also at the massive nature of this movement. And that's quite a key point, because it goes to show how much power people can actually accumulate by taking to the streets. But at the same time, it shows that it was a completely disorganized kind of mobilization. It came from nowhere, essentially. Since the 1990s, and especially since the 2000 years, there was a counter movement emerging versus neoliberalism, which uh, got ever stronger. But during the 90s and the first decade of the 21st century, there were largely smaller movements, which, for example, were against territories being nationalized. And also students took to the streets, demonstrating for their right to an education. The same is true for workers protesting. This means the 2019 movement was one that was kind of collecting all kinds of previous smaller movements, also socio-ecological ones, or also a very pronounced feminist movement. In October 2019, then, we were able to see that this social struggle suddenly was getting everybody on board, so to speak, not just students or not just women or not just a particular group, but the entire society, everybody took to the streets. So society realized that the consequences of neoliberalism to them 
were no longer tolerable. And we were under the control of companies who were only looking at their own profit. So, for example, when we fall ill, all we represent to them is a business item to any hospital. And when we retire, we're also a business item for the pension fund. And that, that led to a lot of negative feelings and developments. And that in turn led to this disruption. I also think, though, that this represents a great power, a great force on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also constitutes a problem because at the moment there is nobody who can politically represent this general negative feeling. The political left, the new left, has committed a great many mistakes. They tried to bundle these social forces, but I think what's got to emerge is a new worker or working class which needs to organize itself, which hasn't yet happened. It's got to happen, though, for them to be able to represent their interests. After all, it's the interests of the very large part of the population. From the 19th to the mid-20th century, that was the age at which trade unions emerged, political parties, defending the interests of the working class. And the culmination of that in our country was the Allende government. But since then, a lot of things have changed and a new working class has emerged, which, as I said, has yet to organize itself. So that's still ongoing. It's a movement that's got to mature yet, that's got to focus, that's got to organize itself. It's a highly interesting process. And I would like to address yet another point, which I would call feminist mobilization. About five years ago, in Chile, but also in Argentina and Brazil and other countries of Latin America, we've seen, and this also goes for a number of other countries, that the feminist movement can mobilize society. It's about violence against women, femicides, and since 2016, that movement became stronger than ever in Chile. Before the social revolt in Chile, there had already been a very major demonstration on 8th March, the International Women's Day. So on 8th 8th of March, women would take to the squares in Santiago and other cities of Chile, and they would actually flock there. And on 8th of March 2020, that is before the pandemic forced us all to stay at home, there were two million women out on the streets of Santiago with a total population of six million, so pretty much Every woman in Santiago was out on the street on that day. Streets and squares of Chile. So, the question is, what will be the effect of that feminist movement in society? And I do believe that the October revolt in 2019 had actually been prepared by that feminist movement. We were protesting the power structures, the injustice, and that resulted in a general intolerance towards social injustice. So if you want a rebellion that kept spreading and which spread to include the entire society eventually, with also the entire society being now ready to go protesting in the streets to demonstrate, and we managed to start with private suffering, domestic violence, for example, and 
move over to developing ourselves into political subjects. So no longer objects of violence or sexual objects, but now political objects, or subjects rather, advocating their rights, protesting for their rights, first individually, but then on a general socialized level, in order to show that the problems that we encountered at home, alone, weren't individual problems, but structural problems to be addressed by the whole of society. And I think that really spread over into the entire society indeed, this kind of rebellion. And that is what, from October 2019 onwards, we've seen up until the present day. The Chilean people is no longer ready to accept injustice. And that's also what we see when members of the police force are out of bounds or kill citizens. That leads to an immediate reaction in the entire society. And that kind of rebellion, I think, was indeed initiated in that October 2019. A year and a half ago, those in power were still able to say to the outside, oh, our people is are very is very happy, we're doing fine, consumer behavior is uh, developing well, the people agree with everything and are happy, but now we've so shown very publicly that that is simply not true. The people are no longer ready to accept that kind of interference, that kind of uh, restriction. To conclude, let me say that government terrorism, the repression executed by the Chilean state and government, which of course existed not just in Chile but in the whole of Latin America, has led to a situation where the political process has become far more brutal and far more militarized. And that kind of oppression has now become a political necessity in order to thus continue to discipline the working class, which is now revolting against neoliberalism. And through the military, Chile, or rather the Chilean government, tries to prevent the Chilean society from democratizing itself, from deciding for ourselves about the questions that affect us all. That was an option we didn't have for 50 years, making a collective decision on the fate of our nation. And this social democratization is what those in power are trying to prevent by way of abusing their power. But the Chilean people will fight against this, will not subject itself. There's a tremendous amount of problems that remain and are as yet unsolved. The problem of the left, as I mentioned earlier, to be taking up the fight of the people and support it. But we still believe that this Chilean movement will not disappear and we won't just give in. It is a process which is ongoing as we speak, and I'm now very much looking forward to discussing further with Susan, with Syed and Mario about this and other global topics. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the two of you for sharing these insights, which of course would have deserved more time than we were able to give you here. But nevertheless, I believe that it gave us a good impression and we have a few minutes left for a discussion. And in fact, there's a question here directed at Susan, also against the backdrop of what Said and Perina have said. Susan, you sh you've shown us the pictures and now we all, of course, share this uh, basic optimism and inherent in it. But nevertheless, there are so many sites, so many locations, but also the composition of these locations, bringing them together, that this is something that's quite indefinite. Said said everybody can take part. Perina said there's an atmosphere, a climate that everyone is sharing, but 
Is that really an indication that we are part of a process that makes a planetary revolution thinkable, or is it to say that people are dissatisfied, they're taking to the streets and they share their feelings, but yet there is not a lot of indication that this could go deeper and that there's something really bringing them together that they share? Uh, so I'm on, yeah. I, should I, I should turn off the, yeah, okay. No, because I'm getting an echo now. Oh, I have to take these off, I guess. But then, of course, I don't hear you. Okay. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. It's so good to actually hear people. And, and uh, Said, your, your comments were uh, just wrenching and uh, uh, one's, uh, one's inadequacies become totally clear. And uh, Pierina, uh, I have a special connection to Chile because I'm working for Allende's uh, Orlando L'Italie and when I was in graduate school. So, I mean, there's, uh, it's, it, there are these connections that people have. They're, they're incomplete. They're, they're, um, they're uh, partial. They're not the center of our lives, which is like for me right here in this room. This is why it was so frustrating not to be able to even hear you hearing me as opposed to because we really feel somewhat caged. Uh, yes. But I think I think we're already there in a way. I mean, uh, in, in a sense, because um, because this forum has made possible a kind of uh, sharing of our frustrations, of our of our uh, non identities. We are we are in totally different situations. There's no doubt about that. But we're still talking. We're still aware of it. We we know the other thing is not working. I mean, was even when the pandemic hit, and suddenly you could not do what you did yesterday at all. It was tragic and difficult, but a little part of your brain said, oh, this is what a revolution, a real revolution would be like. Uh, suddenly, the old way is gone. And you could just have a, a, a little bit of a feeling of what something else, yes, something else could happen because suddenly the entire world is acting differently. So if we turn that dialectically into something that would not be a pandemic, but be something that could we don't have to realize it. We can't. I mean, someone said we have to have a conscience rather than consciousness. I think that's very nice. But we also need consciousness to change. Um, and the, the consciousness has got to be, we know the old is not going to work. So let's not go down that path and let's keep open. Is the problem uh, neoliberalism or is it being bombed uh, by governments uh, you know, is, is, is China a salvation or not? I, I, I'm a little concerned with the, uh, the idea that uh, China, I mean, or English, I know English, but we speak it. Everybody here is somehow, uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, there's a, the Greek of, it, it wasn't Greek, it was koine in the first century. I just wrote a book on the first century. Koine means common. It happened to be Greek. Uh, uh, the Romans had to speak Greek if they wanted to be understood in Syria at the time. So can we just think of English as this uh, common thing lying around that uh, uh, do we have to always identify it with a people or, uh, or whatever? Of course it has that background, but we'll never get out of the background if we keep going back to it. I don't know what it is like to live in a war. Uh, I, I, can, I, I don't know what it is like to live in a refugee camp. Uh, this is what I, where I wanted to go with. It's not easy by looking to know. It's not easy to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's almost impossible. But uh, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't keep doing it. It's like translation, uh, the untranslatable. Nothing's translatable, but we keep doing it. And that that uh, persistence in in the in the face of impossibility, uh, I I find is a form of resilience. Uh, a form of uh, affirmation, uh, not giving up, right? Um, so th this, uh, and, and I want to say something else about the common, uh, common themes of this conference. I'm even stronger a feminist at the, at the end of this than I am the beginning, because what uh, one of the speakers, I think, calls a uh, masculine mandate uh, d doesn't function. Uh, uh, in so many of the uh, discussions and the ways people are looking at things. When Ashil spoke about essentially the master-slave dialectic, he did mention 
workers, but he also mentioned caregivers, and many of them were women who cared for, uh, you know, were wet nurses and cooks and everything for the men who then somehow were these autonomous uh, modern individuals. I think there's a uh, infinite uh, revolutionary possibility in not women, because we know women voted for Trump as opposed to not voting for Trump. I mean, women as a category is not uh, what we're after, but the understanding that uh, from Putin to uh, every dictator in, in, in the world today, um, this, uh, the masculine mandate is, is one of violence. Uh, so to resist violence uh, is, is a terrible choice, uh, but the violence itself, uh, it's not men who do it, but it's a kind of perception of strength and sovereignty. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, war is, is precisely what's been on the table here as well, uh, that, that simply people have got to refuse. They've got to refuse. And I don't mean resistance is, is refused or even armed resistance. This is the importance of the, the dilemma that one is in when the system itself is violence, how does one struggle against it? Um, so I, I, I remain, I, I wanted one more thing. There's a notion of universality I'd like to put on the table and it would be to get away from the notion of partisanship as if I have the truth and you're wrong and I'm going to get rid of you because you don't understand properly. And to replace it with the idea of partiality, partial. I, I see a partial situation. You see a partial situation. And that's why we need each other. Because there is no total picture. Uh, and that's what I was trying to get at with the aesthetics that it seems to me works today and works in um, uh, Milo Rao's film, because he frames incompatible frames that are all there in the same space. So it's a new kind of social realism. It's not socialist realism. It's not pro-working class in some sort of simplistic way. Those are the good guys and the capitalists are the bad guys. There is this constant need to understand the superimposition of incompatible modes or epistemologies uh, and practices and to allow ourselves, uh, and this I think goes beyond dialectics, to allow ourselves to live in that plurality of uh, epistemological frames uh, and not to lose hope or feel guilty or powerless uh, in that context. Uh-oh, I'm not hearing. So, so what, what do you think about, um, with this experience after year 10 of civil war, regarding the question of hope and when uh, has there been a loss and when is something really over? Said, can you hear me? One problem is I can hear you only in German. <laughs> so anyway, I will try to uh, comment two points. And those two points, uh, are, I think the new uh, revolution wave that started, I would say, a little bit with 2005 in Lebanon against uh, the Syrian regime there and continue till today, have taught us something that we tend to forget now, but also it's so important to remind everyone this. I think one of the biggest failure of the last century was forgetting about this point, which is essentially, this is gonna be freaking out for some people, but like essentially communism is feminism. Essentially, we have to remember, to remem to remember also that feminism is not a gender-based and also it's not a sexist, Thing. And I, when I say when I say communism is feminism, I mean that it is the ability to 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 embrace everything and everyone in the one in the one movement of uh, seeking better future. And I cannot see seeking better future without uh, the essential idea of uh, putting forward a better 
understanding for what's happening rather than picturing utopia, we have to have a better understanding of dystopia. And the more we have an understanding of dystopia, the more we are closer to uh, one step closer to achieving utopia. We have to abandon the pre 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 assumption of utopia and focus more on understanding dystopia. And this will lead us one step further for the future. And uh, one thing very important also is uh, every bad event is also a uh, and a key point for opening for a new solution. And those new solutions need a new mind. And so that's why we have to have a um, bigger ear for the new generation and come down to those new generation and talk to them in their language. And in their language, they are so much away from the discord of academic. And the discord of academic have somehow been uh, so much closed in, on itself and it becomes somehow of a way for the leftist in general to run away from and have some dignity of saying, OK, I cannot do anything. Let's uh, focus on theory. But again, theory have no meaning if this theory doesn't have support on the ground by people who really would like to uh, emphasize this. And we need to talk more in the language of the streets if, they if we want to have a a new understanding. That's why I think uh, ground root theory is so important. And that's why I think feminist movement is so important of, of all what's happening. And you can say, see how significant it was even inside the Arabic Spring in, in Sudan. It was led in, totally led by, by uh, female characters. And also Lebanon, it was dominated by female movements. And this is worldwide, I think also in Chile. And to see how much could the world is connected, we don't need to look too far further away from the pandemic and how everything is so much connected that we can say also, we were talking uh, the, the day before, uh, me and you and uh, Brena and about how Mette, for example, the Mette drink and Yorba Mette, how, how did it reach Syria and how what, why it's the main drink for the Syrians uh, because simply people who run away from uh, the war into Cheers for your met. <laughs> the main the main connection is was there even be, be, uh, before the internet. But I think the internet have developed the new what we call it in the around uh, my friend circle we call it the new uh, Alexandria library. And this library is so fragile. If we don't really protect the internet, if we don't really protect what's happening on the internet, we are so much. There's a lot of effort putting by the global uh, capitalists to control uh, the internet as they have been controlling the TV uh, because they want us to go back to brainwashing and rather than actual dialogue. And by actual dialogue, I don't talk about uh, anything but more talking directly face to face to each other. And that's why I say it is essential first to protect and to uh, the feminist movement. And it's, it's so essential also to secondly protect the internet. I think those are the two main comments that I want to say. I would like to follow up on this directly with a question to Pirina. You were saying that there's a process of maturity ongoing where you are and that the traditional left did not manage to do certain things. And I'd be interested in hearing more about this uh, process of maturity and also touching on this idea of speaking the language of the streets. But before I do that, let me ask Julian whether he has some more questions. I would expect that the chat is exploding, isn't it? Thank you, Mario. In fact, we have a great number of questions that have been submitted here, and I'll just choose two. One is directed at Said. The question is, as part of the revolutions, has it become clearer for people what life is worth living for? So beyond rejecting the regime, has it become clear what they are striving or fighting for? And then question at Pirina, what is it that is driving women in Chile to go against government terrorism and machism? What is it that enables these people to really resist? Thank you, Julian. Then Thank you, Julian. I suggest first Pierina, then Said, then Susan, and that unfortunately will also have to be your concluding remarks. 
we figured that the time would be way too short, but that's the way it is, unfortunately. Pierina, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your questions. Obviously, I'd love to have lots more time to discuss at length, but as for the question regarding the left, again, going into details here would uh, take quite a while, but I think, in short, what we had in Chile was a process we've also seen in other countries, which is that the leftist center, say the traditional social democrat territory advocating universal human rights for all, well, after Pinochet, there was this uh, center-left coalition and neoliberalism under that center-left government was actually even deepened, was able to gain an even firmer hold. The privatization of the education sector, of the health sector, actually progressed further also under that government. And that way, the left, in a way, lost its justification, its purpose, and that is what we're feeling the effects of now. At the end of the 80s, when the Pinochet government came to an end, more than 90% of Chileans had very clear political ideas and uh, wishes. Most were voting for parties of the center and the left. And now that's turned around. There's a great many people who have no clear political orientation or preference anymore whatsoever. And that, in a country where less than half of people entitled to vote actually go to vote. This kind of being tired or resigned with the political system of turning away from politics is not really surprising because the center-left parties, which uh, took office as revolutionaries who wanted to um, nationalize all means of productions, they really didn't do well. They didn't deliver in their political decisions after the dictatorship. They screwed up, if you want. And there are movements which did not join up to that model, but they too have a problem with connecting to the real Chile. I mean, there is new types, new forms of consumption, new ways of organizing one's life, and that is not really represented anywhere politically. So, certain workers in extremely precarious conditions aren't even represented by any political party or movement. A lot has simply been left undone. Nobody ever took it up, neither politically nor philosophically, on the left. So the so-called new left isn't actually all that new anymore. And a great many topics were simply ignored, were left out, student movements, for example. And also, this new left now has to confront the task of newly understanding, newly discussing, newly analyzing the new Chile. Progress is always difficult and it's always slow. But what's really required now is defining a left ready and fit to address the challenges and problems in the country, and that is fit to do so. So there's different struggles kind of coming together in this one big project now. And at the current point in time, we do not know where exactly we will be heading. We're trying to get it organized. We're trying to combine the various struggles, the feminist struggle, the struggle for better ecological conditions and better more environmental protection, and trying to reconcile that all in one big movement. And that's the phase in which we are currently with the Chilean left. Now, question of women. There are contradictions there too, between the promise of freedom and equality, and for many, many years, we were sold this idea 
So women to university, women into the labor and job market, go get a job so you don't depend on your husband, so that you don't become like your mother or your grandmother who were forced to stay at home, who were pretty much prisoners in their own home with no income of their own, no work of their own. And it's education that will get you out of that, will make you independent. And still, there's discrimination, there's uh, women being paid less, there's abuse. And still, women usually have less qualified jobs or jobs that are paid less. And that too is a type of discrimination. And also there's a generation issue. Younger women, young women and girls are a lot more rebellious these days as compared to formerly where violence was simply accepted. And now there's the young generation who will stand up against this, who's not ready to accept that violence against women. So across Chile, there's a lot of contradictions of opposing movements, say, which now all take to the streets and become apparent in this big one protest movement. And there's many ruptures there, also brought about by the political realm. There's the discourse on the one hand, and then there's what we do and feel and experience every day in terms of discrimination. Lastly, about what uh, is clear for Syrians, about what is uh, the life worth living, I think it's simple. It's like from the simple motto that people are screaming from the first day in demonstration, and later on, even when they are carrying guns, there's, there's three major uh, key points, which is freedom, dignity and equal and equal rights and you cannot you cannot achieve one without the other and i think justice need to be refound and we need to have a better understanding for what is justice and how we can have a better justice system that can uh, open the door for um, uh, the new transformation for the new world and this transformation cannot go without justice and this transformation cannot go without freedom of speech and freedom of uh, dialogue in general and we have to be open-hearted to hear things that we hate because it was so painful, for example, how uh, everyone supported democracy until democracy brought Hamas in Israel and Palestine. And how much we support, uh, how much we support democracy uh, as, as long as it doesn't bring more, uh, more mercy in, in Egypt, and how much we can really understand that democracy is not an action of immediate uh, turn, but it need like to be long transformation and how much are you open to hear thoughts that you don't want to hear in general and how much you can also have a dialogue with people that you disagree with and dialogue does not need to be so much controlled by previous thought but but open to a to um bigger understanding for the other and this is the three major points are always our freedom justice and equal equal rights Without those three, there is no future for everyone, not just in Syria. Syria just was a clear case how the world system is broken and how much bureaucracy is just um, uh, an excuse to run away from your duties, from our duties as a world, and how much like... Okay. Thank you, Said. Thank you very much, Said. Unfortunately, we have to cut it short here. Even if we were to continue for another 10 minutes, we would never reach the end. And we'll definitely have to this, continue this at some point. We'll see how we can get that done. To all of you, let me say thank you very much indeed for your insights and for at least this food for thoughts and the um, bit of optimism and hope that uh, you and hopefully all of us together have kind of uh, spread out here. Thank you very much indeed. We'll have a very short break and then continue with the next forum. Thank